Мы, по-моему, не режем. М? Мы не режем. А, не режем? Потому что наши что-то говорим про то, что... Нет, мы не имеем это дело. Да. Много видео мы делаем. Ну, да, просто, чтобы это, этот кусок, а потом у вас стрел будет, там, не получается. Да, очень тяжело. Ничего не Интересно, Можем от камеры Кстати, Кстати, где-то по всему находится гнездо птичек вся, и они постоянно прилетаются в стрессе. Вирус в
are very typical of all archaic languages. So we find this combination, combination throughout throughout archaic and basically many many UN languages as well. Although uh, there is an instant topic of uh, how the order varies across the family of phylum. So in uh, both Mongolic and Tungusic, the order is like that. Whereas in Turkic, the order is different. So the plural marker comes closest to the uh, stem, as well as in Mongolic. Whereas the other two are uh, shifted around. So the, the possessive uh, comes first in uh, just for comparison before the case marker. So just for comparison, we've got a nominal for a noun form from Bashkir, a Turkic language, and you see the order is different. So in fact, uh, we see it's a very important question in terms of history of these languages. How, how did it happen that the uh, grammatical values of different orders? And of course, the usual assumption is that the synchronic layers of affixes reflect some processes in the history of these languages and degree of grammaticalization. So uh, with the plural marker, uh, we can say that, well, it fits the more or less universal pattern. I know that there are some deviations somewhere, but the majority of languages that have both uh, uh, number markers and, uh, let's say, ca uh, case for possessive affixes, uh, place uh, number markers closer to the stem because they are most relevant, they are a little bit derivation like and things like that. So this is stable. With the other two are unstable, but, but by the way, just uh, there are some exceptions like Chubash for example, but we don't have to care about them right, right now. So the, the, the stable part is understandable, the unstable part is not entirely understandable and we'll probably come to this a little later. So why did it happen that the uh, case is for the uh, possession in those cases where you can distinguish the, 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 the two. Sometimes it's not easy to tease the two marks apart. Okay, so we'll talk about number a little bit. It's a slightly unusual from a European linguist, let's say, for a European linguist, let's say. So it, it just has two, two and a position of two categories, uh, singular and plural. Number marking is optional, as in Turkey, and Israel's take. This is not an unusual feature of Coptic, so it's very expected from an area of typological uh, perspective. So, as we can expect, uh, number marking is not found with uh, those nominals that are low on some expected hierarchies, such as animacy hierarchy and definite hierarchy. So, if you are talking about, I don't know, some regular occupation of a shepherd, uh, and you mentioned some sheep, um, those are not marked for uh, plurality because it's unimportant and expected. Yeah? So what it does, um, Padma, what is Badma doing? Padma is uh, somewhere with his sheep, and it, it's not marked for the plural. Maybe sheep is not the best example in English for that person. Okay, you understand that. You got my point anyway. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, yeah, one, one other point which is common uh, uh, across alternative languages is that plural markers are absent in uh, constructions with um, numerals. So with uh, numerals, it's not, it's not grammatically possible. You have to say uh, to teachers, and you can't use uh, uh, the plural for the teacher in these, in these constructions. Okay. So what is uh, slightly unusual is that, in fact, there are very many uh, uh, affixes that serve that function, and uh, at least in elder speakers, the, the system seems to be very complicated and unpredictable. So sometimes one of the same noun uh, allows different affixes depending on the situation. And the rules here, if you, you, you probably don't have time to read all of those rules, but what's important is that they are sound a little illogical. So, for example, here. I understand it. It's me who is to blame here, but uh, it's believe me, it's the best uh, kind of rules you can come to. Yeah, so something. This one is used if it's human and stems end in a schwa, and this one is uh, with the stems is ended in a consonant, and this is just originally <coughs> written in the marker on the sound nouns. So uh, I understand it's a little bit like uh, classification of dogs, yeah, by workers, which is 
uh, usually quoted in situations like that. But so sometimes it's important to take uh, the, the, the uh, what the stem looks like into account. Sometimes it's more important whether it's human or non-human. Sometimes it's just a short list of um, uh, nouns that take uh, particular uh, particular uh, particular uh, markers. Well, moreover, sometimes it looks like uh, there is a common origin for some of those. For example, hood and de, okay, you can understand that these, these are related. And you can probably even remember from uh, the, the other day that uh, the high lattice is not possible in company. So, well, it's expected that something like hood cannot be attached to, uh, to, a, um, uh, to a stem ending in a vowel. And this is indeed a rectification, but otherwise they are uh, properly derived from um, uh, uh, originally different sources. So nerd and mood and sir, well, definitely don't have anything in common um, significantly, and uh, maybe they just got translated into something like a category, but not entirely a category uh, in uh, modern common. So if you really view a number as a full fledged as a full fledged grammatical category in Kalmyk, then uh, in this respect, Kalmyk is not an ideally agglutinative language. Again, we discussed this topic last time, and we come to it again, and we'll uh, encounter other uh, manifestations, other deviations from the canonical uh, agglutination to the so um, yeah, because because you have to remember it. Sometimes. Uh, number markers, as, uh, to conclude, number markers are weakly grammaticalized, and some linguists even view mongolic number markers as derivational rather than inflection. So, it's a possibility to say that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a uh, grammatical category per se, uh, but something, uh, something different. Uh, I think it's somewhere in between. So, uh, in fact, we have some syntactic manifestations of grammatical marking of number, such as uh, occasional. Um, agreement sometimes, not very frequently, but uh, so um, I, I, I think it's on its way into a uh, regular grammatical uh, category, although maybe relatively recent. Okay, so cases uh, the exact number of uh, in the, the exact size of uh, case inventory is to some extent a matter of debate, so we, I, I'll show you some tables. Assume that there are uh, nine uh, cases in uh, Kalmyk, but we'll discuss some problematic cases as well, some problematic instances as well. Uh, so uh, there is quite a bit of uh, case allomophy, which is conditioned by uh, stem types, as expected. Uh, for example, morphological properties of stem, of course, do play a role, as we discussed. Uh, there is a huge distinction between vocabulary and consonantal stems, but there is a some uh, some other rules as well, like for example, monosyllabic nouns uh, can behave differently from polysyllabic nouns and so forth. And uh, to some extent, it's idiosyncratic, so um, it's not really easy to come uh, to come up with a particular form or particular form of the stem which would automatically project all the forms. We'll see some examples uh, right right now. Here is. Uh, here is the basic table, let's say. Uh, uh, the nominative is unmarked. We expect this, of course, so no, uh, no markers. Sometimes we see uh, that there is just one allomorph for most uh, more peripheral cases. Oh, I just forgot to put the here. Yeah, it's not automatic. We discussed this. So here the uh, alternations are automatic. Let's have, uh, as this is at school, yeah, I can ask questions if you uh, about what was in the last class. So do you, for example, let's start with uh, the committed, for example. What kind of allomorphs do you expect? It's simple. With a. With a, yeah, that's it. Yeah, just two of them. Yeah, so depending on the vowel count. What about the instrumental? What do you expect? With a, uh, with a, yeah, and with, and with a, okay, good, yeah. So, uh, which uh, provides four variants. It might be r, r, a, hat, okay. Depending on whether the there are front vowels or back vowels, and depending on whether the preceding uh, sound is a consonant or um, um, uh, a vowel. Okay, what about last? Uh, how many do you expect? Okay, you don't have to. 
pronounce all of those, but how many? What do you think? Six. Almost. Four yes. is your answer. Okay. It's kind of, it must be a kind of an option. So you know four. Okay. You know six. Okay. So there are two binary, uh, three binary features. One is again uh, the uh, frontness or backness of the vowel. The other is uh, whether the stem is there or the stem is uh, ends in a consonant or in a vowel. And the third one is and the schwa. Yeah, the schwa is problematic. So it depends on what poil we know. Yeah, so sometimes it's us, uh, sometimes it's us. It depends on its position. Information structure, the next word, and whatever. So maybe on style or something. So eight. Okay, you could do that, but I'm sure you can. Okay, maybe you can also do this one. You can get. Of course, I, I, I'm sure you can. We didn't discuss it, but of course it depends. The choice here depends on whether the preceding um, uh, uh, sound is a consonant or a vowel. It's not regular. So again. It's not an automatic rule which predicts that uh, you have to insert E before a consonantal suffix or the other way around. If the, uh, the, the affix uh, contains an E, it must be deleted. Yeah. You can't predict it from general rules. What you can predict, though, is that there must be some rule that will help handle every single case where potential hiatus can, uh, can appear. Yeah. So you have to somehow eliminate it. And finally, with this, I'm sure you can see. Uh, so it must be, it's the most complicated part. So there are uh, three possibilities, and um, they are distributed according to some natural um, uh, rules, let's say. So let's have, some, uh, let's have a look at some examples. So, well, uh, generally speaking, it's quite accurate. So, har is quite predictable. Uh, we've got nine forms. Okay, accusative is problematic. Uh, you can expect, if you know that it's an altaic language, you'll get like two forms for the accusative, and we'll discuss this uh, in a minute. So, it's the way it's traditionally represented in grammar. Another alternative will be to say, like, okay, this is just an unmarked form, which is sometimes used in the direct object. But this is problematic for company, so we'll do that. Did I ask you? Alright, so here we don't have uh, no irregularity, and that's something like a basic allomorph probably is in for the genitive. Okay, so one rule, uh, there are some uh, extra rules. Uh, you, don't, you, you also can disregard the shortening of vowel, we have discussed it before, so uh, for Let's say for the corpus, it's a little irregular, so you have to know whether it's that, uh, it, there is a long vowel in oblique case uh, forms here, um, whereas here it's short, and here it's short again, and it's not long here. You have to remember that ha is underlined a short vowel word, and z is underlined a long vowel word. Okay, it's not important. What is uh, slightly more important is that. Uh, again, there are two possibilities to avoid hiatus, let's say. Yeah. So we, we see here that noha is a stem which ends with in a vowel, so you can't use in instead. So what you do is you use a short uh, uh, affix for, uh, for the genitive, so it's just n. But with one, one monosyllabic uh, verse, the uh, way to avoid, to avoid this problem is different, so you use in. So we sort of recognize this good, it's not the, not the only place in the grammar of comment where it is used to avoid hiatus. But the tricks, so to say, the grammatical tricks to avoid the hiatus are different depending on some extra uh, knowledge, let's say. Okay? So, and here uh, comes the most complicated part. So, these are uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, kind of uh, detention class or something which is not predictable from anything else. You just have to somehow struggle with these uh, words. These are words with the so-called unstable N. What this means is that, well, although N is there in the uh, basic form of the noun, so if you just ask what's the word for the horse, um, the answer will be N. 
Uh, but uh, in fact, this is sometimes there and sometimes it's not there. For example, in the accusative, it's not there. Uh, in the uh, associative case, it's not there, it's not that. But sometimes it's there, for example, in the ablative or in the directive or commutative and so forth. So this is just an arbitrary list of cases. So they are not motivated by any evident uh, semantic thing or whatever. Well, of course, a technical solution will be that just to treat it as part of suffixes, case suffixes. But uh, there are way too regular and uh, historically they are reconstructed very, very deeply as some uh, specific Mongolian phenomenon to treat it this way. So uh, just be, uh, we will sometimes see example with this and somewhere in the next slides. And uh, for technical reasons, it's uh, interlinearized as an extension. Doesn't mean much, uh, but uh, sometimes it's there. Uh, sometimes it's there. Okay, so uh, uh, words like that have uh, their special way of uh, forming the genitive. So just in this case, exceptionally, the genitive is the, the multiple of the genitive is a uh, something something which is not found anywhere else. Okay, but the biggest change is in a different place because here and here only you see that in fact uh, okay the, the the one of the accusative forms is expected we have the regular accusative affix which is given and it's uh, attached to the uh, to the stem okay we have to remember that the variant of stem which is used in the accusative without the end, but it sometimes happens in other cases as well. However, what's uh, uh, exceptional here is that the unmarked form of the accusative doesn't have this end. So the accusative is among those cases which doesn't have end, and the nominative is among those cases which does. Which creates, uh, creates a contrast between the nominative and the unmarked accusative which is not found anywhere else in this grammar and to the best of my knowledge it's not found, anything like that is not found in other voltaic type languages with the differential object marking. So differential object marking, the, the, the possibility to have two different accusative forms depending on some definiteness, animus and something like that is omnipresent in northern Eurasia. But it's not omnipresent that the shortest form with no uh, markers at all, uh, which you find in the grammar, is actually the uh, accusative form. Okay? We'll talk about this a little bit later, and it poses some uh, interesting theoretical questions. Because, for example, one possibility is to think that this end here is actually an overt nominative marker. It's quite a possibility, although, uh, in terms of, um, uh, well, technologically, it's not very expensive. There are some languages with marked nominatives, but there are few and not typical of this area of, 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 the, of, of the world. And besides, well, it's also a problem because, okay, if this n is here, the marker of the nominative, then what is here then? Is it also a marker of the nominative which is stacked together with something else? Well, it's not an elegant solution, let's say. So, a still other possibility will be to say that this is the marker of the nominative, but this one is an unrelated marker of the genitive, which is not, unrelated marker of the dative, which is nin, and so forth. But it's again uneconomic. So, I think the, the, the most economic solution we could come to was like here, but of course it has its price. Yeah? So, for example, we have to posit some extension without any meaning, which is somewhere, according to some rules. Not, not comfortable, definitely, so it's somehow related to grammar, per se, but uh, without any clear uh, regularity behind it. Okay, so this is basically the summary of what we already uh, discussed. Uh, and some case forms, uh, and it's present in the nominative and exit from the animal acute. So let's have uh, some actual example of use. So if you can, the word which is um, uh, which means girl, uh, finally enough, in the plural it um, um, means, it, it means children, which is nice because main, mainly words like that are based on uh, masculine nouns, but uh, comics are very modern in this respect, so the, 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 the word for girl, for describing 
children in general, uh, regardless of their sex. So uh, Kuken is the word for uh, for its denominative form is here, and here we have uh, the usual contrast. So Badma kissed a girl. These translations are some somewhat simplified. Yeah. So just some context in which the speaker chooses not to uh, use the accusative form is like that. Like that. Kuken different from Kuken and Badma kissed this girl is. So the overt, uh, the overt uh, marker. So uh, you don't have to um, uh, take it too seriously in terms of translations. But well, two possibilities are possible, uh, are, are present, are uh, observed, and none of those two two possibilities coincide with the uh, nominative form here. Okay, so we have a three-way contrast. Okay, typologically this is uh, slightly. Uh, unusual. So, contrasting uses of this kind, uh, kind uh, is labeled a differential object market, a huge topic, and it's preferably um, uh, studied uh, based on uh, text uses, usages, and uh, the rules are not very transparent. So, you, in isolation, you can present many, many, many contexts which can be translated into common with either of these forms of the two forms and both are fine. Uh, so uh, here I present sort of a uh, general picture of let's say factors which influence the choice of the form for the uh, direct object. Well it's both predictable and unusual in terms of uh, if you look at this from a typological perspective because well the, the uh, factors which play a role are uh, very predictable. So, what are these factors? First, we see uh, uh, okay uh, how this um, table is to be read. So, each cell contain, contains two possibilities: so zero or a word accusative, and some uh, acceptability symbols. Let's say so. Here, if we have a non-specific inanimate um, uh, object, uh, which is in the focus. You can't use the accusative marker at all. So the only possibility is an unmarked, uh, an unmarked direct object. But here there are some gray zone, and in the end, on the opposite uh, pole of the continuum, let's say, we got situations where uh, all speakers would agree that the only possibility that you've got is the one with the with an avert accusative marker. Okay. So the situation is mixed, and in fact, with all due respect to Masha Kanashanka who did this work, I think that it's still a simplification. So it's already quite complex, but of course it doesn't mean necessarily that well for every uh, combination of features you, you will have homogeneous uh, reactions from speakers will be, which will uh, fully accord to those symbols that you get here. So well, it captures some uh, great gradients here, but uh, not necessarily the details. However, I don't think that the, uh, this uh, distribution we have to go through it in detail. But I, uh, in detail, but I think we still can uh, talk about the dimensions which are present in this space. Let's say so. The first dimension is specificity, and for um, for the sake of simplicity, uh, I just omitted the uh, anything between non-specific and definite. So of course there are uh, indefinite. Uh, specific entities, but they are the extremes. Let's say they are different. You see much more, much darker cells here than here. Then, in both situations, especially here in non-specific, the non-specific domain, there is a difference between inanimate, animate, and human entities. And of course, they have they show some gradients with humans being more likely to be overtly marked again in accordance with uh, expectations. And the third dimension, which is slightly less. Um, uh, prominent in descriptions of other Voltaic languages, although maybe it's not less prominent in the actual use of other Voltaic languages in this one, which relates to the information structure. So these are here in this table we have three possibilities. Maybe it's not the uh, all the possibilities that you can think about. So the one is uh, the object noun phrase, which is in the focus. So who did but not kiss, but not kiss that girl you had to mark, or at least the um, uh, um, uh, um, 
sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the least marked, yeah, the least marked is uh, this one, so it's when it's in the focus. The other one, the other possibility, which is somewhere in the middle, uh, is the one where the order is still SOP, as is the default pattern, but um, uh, uh, the object noun phrase is not in the focus. And finally, uh, the uh, situation which triggers uh, a word marking most of all is the situation where the object is fronted for purposes of topicalization, as for this girl, uh, but not kissed her or something like that, more than this. Okay? So when it's uh, prior knowledge or definite and it's not in the pre-verbal position where it should be, speakers tend to use an avert marker for, for, for the director. Okay, so, um, uh, and it's a possibility that is found in text with uh, quite noticeable uh, frequency. All right. I'll now speak about uh, some uh, selected case functions and their, um, their manifestations. So the functions of the so-called date or as it's referred to in traditional grammars, and in accordance with its Russian name, covers um, several uh, semantic domains, including marking of the recipient, uh, marking of the goal, and location. So I will give you all this sheet. Um, chimed in to you, a recipient. I went to another, so of course, uh, I didn't suppose there either. So of course, there is again with the same marker. And uh, in uh, 1954, I was in Siberia. Okay, Siberte, as I said, is something which is used very frequently in text for understandable reasons. So uh, this is again uh, the dated case, which doesn't. Uh, uh, um, this uh, doesn't mean any uh, directional here, but just uh, just a location. Okay, so we have uh, all of these uh, three functions uh, merged together in one marker, and we have then uh, ask ourselves if, if this is uh, common in this area and elsewhere. Well, sort of yes and sort of no. We can have a uh, no, very simplistic typology based on these uh, parameters. So, for example, in Russian, we. As you know, uh, we have uh, three uh, different um, uh, means of expression for all, for each of these two, uh, three meanings. So we have a we have a Moscow, we have a Okay, there is some similarity between go and location, and it's systematic. So the prepositions are the same, but uh, the difference between location and direction is expressed overtly by the choice of the case. Uh, but there is some similarity here in English. The grouping is different, so uh, recipient and goal are identical, and location is different. And finally, there are languages like Cognic and French, which uh, display uh, one the same pattern for the three domains. So, of course, it's something like a semantic map. Well, it's actually part of um, a semantic map for uh, goal and recipient domains. So. Uh, we can explain both this link and this link. So here is the common feature that is related to locations and space, and here the uh, um, uh, the common feature that something changes and there is some motion involved, although there is a difference between just uh, spatial low or a recipient, which is uh, ultimately a possessor of it. But however, uh, we can have an explanation uh, for both. Uh, links. However, although sort of attested elsewhere in the world, as, like in French, for example, this pattern is nevertheless, from a non-Eurasian perspective, is mainly a specific trait uh, of uh, uh, Mongolian languages. So uh, I, I now uh, use um, a table from Amrita Pakindorf's work. And uh, you know, in my view, this table is probably not the most readable uh, table we can think of because it should be read as follows. So, for example, for Earl Turkic, recipients are encoded by the dative, goals are uh, encoded by the relative case, and location is um, um, expressed by a dedicated locative case. However, the uh, uh, second row is to be re read as follows. So the later is here in the recipient column, but it should be understood that it's also expressed as the go in okay. So wherever there is a blank, it means that uh, the functions to the left 
are expressed by the same uh, by the same uh, case numbers. Okay, so here we've got huge number of languages, including uh, most modern Turkic languages, which have mm, uh, a common way of expressing recipients and goals. In fact, uh, although the word which we use here, is, uh, which Vegeta use here, is uh, later some, in some descriptive grammars of Turkic languages, it's referred to as data. It's not important. What is important is that location is encoded differently. Okay. So uh, and we see that the only uh, the, the the only noticeable um, um, uh, taxon where uh, where one and the same case is is employed for all the three meanings is Mongolic. And for Mongolic, it's a very stable feature. And as far as I know, all Mongolic languages display it. Uh, besides, you see Sahar, Yakutsky here. Uh, um, and, uh, well, we don't have to care about this because uh, that's actually the point that Brigitte is making is that Sahar actually borrowed this pattern from uh, Mongolic at some point of its development. So it's originally a Mongolic pattern, non typical of other Turkic languages, and Sahar is a Turkic language that, some, in this respect, patterns together with Mongolic and unlike all other um, mm -hmm. uh, Turkic languages except for Dogan as well. Okay, so <coughs> I know, I, I, maybe I, I must make a commentary here. I know that, in fact, those of you who are familiar with Altaic languages don't see anything, and mostly don't see much unusual in what I present about coming. So that's why wherever I find at least something which uh, differentiates public or Mongolic in general from, let's say, Turkic and Tunguzic, I want to stress it, because for me it's significant and it means that, well, uh, it's not something that you already know if you've heard talks about, you know, Turkey or Tatar or something like that, okay? So I understand from that from a global perspective it's just almost nothing, because they're very similar anyway, yeah. But um, that's, that's the truth, so comic is indeed very similar to uh, other Altaic languages and those aspects of its problem. Okay, so an unusual feature which probably needs more attention, but I can be, can make uh, justice to it, is the coexistence of the two cases which are completely arbitrarily referred to here as uh, commutative and associative. So in fact, uh, if there were just one of them, uh, uh, any of them would be individually referred to as commutative and would give you some idea of what's it all about. But for some reason there are two cases like that, sometimes they are interchangeable. I would even say more, I would even say that most of the time they are interchangeable. So in typical um, uh, competitive situations, so uh, an agent and a co-agent, which is somewhere in the scene, but some slightly backgrounded, um, not the main protagonist or something like that, um, you can use both. So for example, here we have an example with the commutative, tomorrow you will get event with that person, uh, mm, uh, uh, is the commutative form that I think associative is also possible, could have been used here, but I'm not sure, but not almost sure. Uh, however, there are some discrepant features, so uh, some context where uh, one, of the, uh, one of the case suffixes is possible and the other one is not, and the most noticeable one, let's say, is the one which is somehow related to possession, and here the associative here has unusual features, namely it marks the possessi uh, in a noun phrase had by the possessor. So uh, I want to emphasize this. So it's not the other way around. It's not the genitive mark. It doesn't mark the possessor when there is the possessive, which is the head, but the other way around. So for example, he was a strong man. Uh, is literally something like terin ikutsak kun bila. So uh, what we've got here is the idea of being a strong man is expressed as the man being the head, the possessor. The, uh, the man with a big body, something like that. So the one endowed, uh, can, you, can you say endowed? I know. Uh, and the one which is characterized uh, by a big body. So what is important for me here is that 
you got this equation here, which is the so uh, if not for that, and in fact, Tsukasu uh, uh, is body and Tsukasa, if you just ask, asked uh, a speaker of Kalmyk, what does this mean? The answer would be strong, it's an adjective. Okay, and it makes perfect sense. But here we have this ikke, which is there. So in fact, the marker takes its scope over the combination of these two words. So it's an argument for treating it as a case affix, not as a derivational affix which derives. So if we only have this one, uh, meaning body, and this one, meaning strong, the answer, the first answer we could think of, thinking about the status of this affix, would be, well, it's a derivational affix that takes a noun and produces uh, an adjective, which means um, someone who um, is characterized by a particular possessor or particular property. But sometimes it's possible, not very frequently, sometimes it's possible to uh, encounter examples like that. A woman with two children, um, um, a house with eight uh, windows, something like that is also possible. So with numerals or um, uh, some adjectives and something like that. Typically not very extended structure. So numerals and adjectives, I don't think anything else. So I don't think you can say some, something like, you know, a woman uh, with but must children or something like that. It's too complicated for it to be inserted within this structure. Okay? So it's somewhere between an adjectivizer uh, and, um, and a case marker. Yeah, so uh, deliberately, uh, it's, you, you remember I mentioned this in the beginning when I said uh, we will be treating the counting system as a system with nine cases and that was one of the dubious points, let's say. So some people say it's not a case market, something else. Okay, here we got a, um, an example in favor of the case analysis. Okay, what's the question? Uh, about this, but, um, uh, Which one? About now. this uh, case, like the uh, studies, can we use uh, this with the uh, definite noun without any uh, any modifiers? But yeah. is it issue about uh, is it an issue about uh, uh, modifiers mm -hmm. or definiteness or indefiniteness references? Well. I don't, know, I don't know how to answer a question because what I remember is that uh, possessors were really problematic and I think that demonstratives are problematic as well. So what about this one? So I don't think it's very easy to define whether uh, this um, root, let's say, has a real reference. Because if it does, then it's definite. Because it's uh, about this, this particular body, yeah, or particular, I don't know, bucket. A woman with a bucket, okay, the, the bucket is referential, something like that. So, well, generally speaking, I think the answer is no. So, it's not possible, but, uh, uh, but at the same time, it's very hard to prove, and for me, it's easier to word uh, uh, the same idea in terms of uh, syntactic structure, because it's more uh, visible, let's say. You can really ask questions about possessors and about relative causes and things like that, and you can say, but is this one, I don't know, definite or not? Because if you tra translate it with something like, you know, with a big body, then this body belongs to this man and something like that. Although, of course, it's a characteristic. Okay, so, but most of the time, in terms of text textual frequency, most of the time, it's used um, in context. Okay, so, so the rule is uh, knowledge, and what's suspicious, so to say, is in fact, knowledge is an active noun. Well, sometimes, sometimes it is used as a noun, but uh, it mostly denotes uh, property when it's used in context like that. So a knowledgeable person is something which is uh, very frequently said about old men or something like that, so with knowledge, something like that, possessing a no some, some, some sort of knowledge. So in terms of frequency, this is more typical, and that's why I understand uh, perfectly well uh, why it's mostly treated as adjectivizing in traditional terms. And what about proper names? And, uh, I don't think proper names are possible here. Yeah. 
the pronounce pronounce I think so. Yeah, I think so. Although again, in order to check, I have to first see there was there was a, in our group. Let's say there was a person who was so responsible for this topic. There are more details that I can provide at this moment, and maybe additional research is needed. So it's an interesting question, of course. And uh, and it's, it's very similar patterns are found through, uh, throughout Voltaic. Uh, so I think it's um, I don't I'm not aware of anybody who really systematically uh, studied the status uh, of these things. Although I know some studies in Jacobin about other individual marriages in this area. Okay. okay, so one, uh, one <coughs> other use of associative, which is very common uh, in, in comic, it's based, it's, it's used in uh, 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 predicate possessive constructions, so in constructions which express meaning such, such as I have some money, or a car, or a daughter, or something like that. So that's the basic one, not the only one, but the basic one. So I had some money, would be uh, I. Literally, I was with money. I was. If you want some like money fool, I don't know. Can you say something like that? I don't know. Uh, so it's uh, again an affix which uh, creates this idea of um, um, possession. And here, uh, its combinatorial uh, potential is uh, relatively wide. So you can uh, use not only necessarily um, possessives, possessives like. Um, uh, physical objects, but also I know um, uh, leg or uh, young daughter, but things like that. So, uh, and is there a parallel construction with the uh, data from the possessor and the unmarked possessive? Yes, the, uh, not the lot, not the data, but the lot. Yeah. Uh, so it's the same case, but there are there are functional distinct. Yes, generally speaking. The data from the fact, yeah, the data. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, it's parallel. I'd say it's less frequent, although um, I'm not sure about the counts. Uh, well, I think I'm sure it's less frequent, although I can say if it's like uh, 5% or 15%. I'm not sure about this, but the basic way to express uh, predicate possession is like like this. So, um, um, uh, typologically, it's a common, uh, common strategy which is uh, found in uh, different parts of the world uh, as well, uh, but it's not very common um, in uh, our part of the world. So that's uh, a map from um, uh, Stassen, and um, uh, we see that the pattern, that th this kind of pattern here labels. Conjunctional, so not necessarily something like with, but uh, uh, you know, something that we observed in uh, in Kalmyk. So you see, uh, in terms of global frequency, it's quite it's doing, it's doing very well. So it's basically the second most uh, frequent pattern that Stassen identifies, but it's common in Africa and uh, Australia, somewhere else, but almost absent from. Uh, uh, Ratio. So this one is, is this Chuchi? I don't know, Chuchi is like this. Okay, this one is, okay, I know that some people are giving a course in Chuchi here. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, anyway, so uh, Mongolic is not like that, at least it's classified like that by Stassen. I don't know, uh, I know that this pattern is present in, uh, in Mongolic as well, but maybe it's a minor pattern in Mongolic as so well. One of those few cases which I cherish where Kalmyk seems to deviate even from other Mongolic languages, at least from our, based on our texts. Yeah. So that was the pattern there. And well, I would have, uh, it, it, I would be glad to attribute it to some aerial influence, but <laughs> there is nothing like that around. Maybe I don't know. Does anybody know if there is something like that in Dagestan? So I uh, no, doesn't look like. Yeah, that doesn't sound. Like so um, yeah, so uh, typically Turkic languages mostly uh, have the genitive structure, so completely different thing. So uh, uh, the boy's car there is would be the unmarked, the default Turkic pattern, and as far as I understand, most Dagestanian languages use the same. Yeah. Okay. 
sure of it. At least many of them do this. I don't, I'm not sure if all of them. Okay, so I have no explanation why this happens. And uh, besides this uh, coexistence of two commutatives uh, uh, is um, um, uh, unusual. So apart from the associative, we have the uh, 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 antonymic forms for, for the same uh, domain. So, surbulta uh, uh, will be knowledgeable, um, educated, or wise person, and an ignorant person will be also derived from the abstract noun for knowledge. So, surbulta was. And you probably even remember this word which I mentioned in, uh, in morphology part because it's unusual uh, because it doesn't, uh, doesn't obey the vowel harmony rule. It's not seen here, but believe me. Um, so, quite arbitrarily, it's not lost as the case marker here. So, here it's, uh, it's lost as if it were a negative copula. It's, uh, the reason for this is that uh, speakers of Kalmyk can also produce longer, less grammaticalized structures with the same meanings. With the same meaning, so a man with no knowledge. So, and in fact, in fact, this part here looks as if it were uh, just a relative clause or something like that. So you can even say something like so, so there is no knowledge, no education nowadays or something like that. So it's um, something like a sentence, but you can also use it as a modifier for a person. It would mean that such a person that there is no knowledge. So ignorant, an ignorant person, and it's not just. Exceptional for this knowledge, it can be also used for, I don't know, um, a person without an arm or uh, without a uh, ch uh, childless uh, woman or something like that. So, lots of uh, different uh, meanings related to possession which can be expressed with both of these ways. And of course, the uh, more compact uh, pattern with the um, uh, carative marker. So to say, is more typical in terms of textual frequency, but they know very well that it's somehow a contracted form of this one, and this one can be used in some emphatic context, or if a stupid uh, non-speaker asks uh, what was going on. Yeah, so for that purpose, you can uh, spell it out in, let's say, full form. So that's one of the reasons we took that we made those that um, arbitrary decision to not treat this one as a case affix, although it's, uh, in many contexts it's uh, very valuable. So a child, uh, and a person with knowledge, a person without knowledge, a woman with children, a woman without children, and so forth. And also allows for modifiers, sometimes, but limitedly, so and so forth. So that's something uh, which has to be um, um, discussed. Okay, case setting. It's again about Let's say, uh, as you see, the underlying topic in this part of my presentation is grammaticalization. And again, this is relevant uh, for grammaticalization because, well, if we have uh, case markers uh, stacked together, it somehow shows that, well, probably these are not uh, part of a uh, well behaved medical category as you imagine it. So these are not very frequent, but sometimes some combinations are possible. Semantically, they are very predictable and very transparent. So uh, you can have something like Gere, which is house, Gerte is within the house, or in the house, or to the house, or many different things. But uh, to um, express the idea from within the house, you can, you can use Gertasil. So um, uh, there is this tiny semantic difference. You can uh, attach the ablative marker directly to the house. But then it will be slightly uh, obscure whether it was from within the house or just from the house. Maybe it's um, uh, someone was in front of the house and then moved from this place somewhere else, and it will be get uh, a But with this particular one, get a it's necessarily uh, denotes the meaning that someone was within the house first, and then this get uh, functions uh, as if it were a noun denoting the inner space of the house, so that, that from this one you can use the ablative form, which will naturally denote the uh, meaning of motion from this inner space. Okay. So similarly here, um, oh, I didn't mention <coughs> this kind of usage for an associative, but it's very much predictable from the portrait we had. So uh, it, it's also used in age contexts. So the person of three, if you, my, my, my son is three year old, will be my son, 
my son is with three different. Uh, so Hurte, Hurtak, sorry, uh, is um, um, the one with three, which means the one with, who is three years old. And you can also use something. Like so since I was three. So Hurte is three, Hurtak is with three or three year old, and Hurtak has said is since I was three. Okay. So again, very transparent semantically, and again, uh, the problem is whether whether it's uh, really a case marker. Well, probably it's not, but also we have these ones, so it's kind of a, so it's not uh, it's not entirely clear where we should start and where should we should stop. Yeah. So uh, definitely not uh, possible for the genitive, not possible for the accusative. So no case no case taken there. Uh, with more peripheral cases, um, like instrumental or associated with native, sometimes. Okay, so possession. Uh, a few words about possession. Uh, possessive marking is present, so uh, head marking, I mean, um, but it's uh, uh, weakly uh, grammaticalized compared to uh, other Altaic languages, especially Turkic, and uh, in this respect, Mongolic patterns together with Tungusic. So there are several manifestations uh, of the fact that uh, possession, possessive affixes on the head now are weakly grammaticalized. The most obvious one is that they are rarely used. So uh, I'm not sure about frequency, frequencies again, but as far as I understand, the default way, at least in uh, more contemporary speakers of common of expressing ideas like my mother, will be completely uh, uh, Western European, so to say. So we would like something like my mother with this one in the genitive. Well, in fact, mm, you can also use uh, a very um, uh, redundant pattern with both the genitive marker and head marker. And finally, you can also use um, uh, the uh, Altaic type. Uh, construction here, so it can, which would just mean my mother by virtue of there being uh, an suffix. So, uh, lots of variation, and it's not quite clear. So, with this one, it's more or less clear. It's emphatic. Uh, for example, if you have a contrast like your mother is that and that, and whereas my mother is that and that, okay, you can probably, you will probably use this one. Well, uh, these two. Age is definitely a factor because this one looks like Russian and this one does not. But otherwise, I can't. I can Well, at least now I can say um, which one is um, uh, more frequent and what's the difference if there's any. Okay, so uh, uh, in, 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 uh, um, it, it's typical of Mongolic languages to have weakly grammaticalized uh, uh, markers. They uh, are, tra are traced back to gender forms of the same uh, possessive uh, of gender forms of personal pronouns uh, which were attached as suffixes, so a redundant pattern. Uh, there are some comparisons with other Mongolian languages, probably we don't have to have about those. So what is unusual about uh, Mongolic and it's, uh, sh this feature is shared with the music, but again is different from uh, Turkic is there there is apart from the expected pattern of possessive affixes for the six combinations of person and number so my your and so forth you we also have mm, reflexive possessive markers uh, that's how they are used so the father uh, the father is holding his son the son is not marked for the uh, uh, third person possessed but instead there is a dedicated uh, marker which signals that this son is actually his father's son. Okay. So um, uh, you can you can see that. So you, you see the difference here. The possessive marker is the third person because it's uh, the father belongs to this son. So his father literally something which will uh, probably cause some problems for the bank story. I'm not sure about this. Okay, maybe the whole these problems are solved. But uh, anyway, so uh, 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 we, we have uh, both, uh, both of these nouns are marked for possession, but this one is marked for the third person possession because the possessor is not the subject, it's the direct object, and this one is marked for the uh, reflexive because 
the possessor is the subject. Okay? So, um, 16 and 17 are just two examples which show this contrast circuit. So you have some, some like a minimal pair. But I gave her book to Bagma and necessarily means that they belong to Bayakta. Whereas if you use the possessive, uh, third person possessive marker, it might mean uh, whatever you wish. So it might be Bagma's book or it might be some, someone else's book, but it might cannot be uh, Bayakta. So, in fact, these are very prominent in uh, Calvin Grammar, and I want you to remember about these possessive reflexive markings because you will need those for um, um, uh, close companion, which we're going to discuss the day after tomorrow. Okay. So, but if we, we need to remember uh, that possessive reflexive uh, is uh, only present. Okay. So these uh, you know, possessive, uh, uh, possessive markers uh, uh, bring uh, more violations to uh, ideal agglut agglutination. So for example, you probably remember uh, the acoustic marker IG, which is like the main marker and it's more or less predictable based on the distinction between IG and G with regular nouns, but in possessive, uh, with possessive forms it's different, it's like this. So I won't discuss the many compli uh, complications that there are, uh, just a few of them, but what I want you to remember is again that this is just, uh, you have to know these rules, obviously. It's not predictable from morphotactics or something, although the radical, uh, well, it's clear from the general pattern that you first have the root, then the case marker, and then the possessive marker, okay. So you have to identify this E and the marker of the accusative, while it uh, resembles of the E marker, which is found in the regular accusative, but still is different, it's not predictable, based on morphology, it must be referred to as a special non agglutinative rule, okay. All right, so just uh, by uh, a way of illustration, uh, how complicated this system and how non agglutinative it sometimes is, I give you uh, one particular kind of inflection. This is the possessive reflexive. So we disregard the first person possessor, second person possessor, and so forth. But what about these? So the ideal is here. So, Raptam, uh, for example, is an ideally agglutinative word form because it contains the root, the case marker, and the possessive reflexive. So everything is fine. So we can, based on these examples, we can see that an is the base form uh, of the possessive reflexive marker. But what about the other forms? Well, all sorts of complications. For example, here, asin, varn, arm, they are not distinguishable, distinguishable into parts. So just for your reference, instrumental is ar. So we expect something like aran, but in fact it's arm. Um, uh, so and so forth. So here uh, the, the commutative is la, so we expect something like la an, okay, maybe la an or something like that, but we've got just la and uh, this is totally unpredictable from any of the phonology, it's just there. So you have to remember combination, combinations. So some would even go further and say that, well, it's cum a cum uh, cumulative marker. Yeah. So then uh, I, I, I admitted in the very beginning that there is no accumulation, accumulation here, but sometimes we come very close to it because, well, you can sort of think that there is some morphology between the two affixes, but to, to tease them apart is uh, problematic. And finally here, so uh, the accusative actually doesn't, the possessive accusative, as we saw in the previous uh, slide uh, here, could be had probably didn't pay attention to this, but there is no accusative marker. So just the possessive reflexive is enough. Uh, functionally, it's very well understandable because there is no confusion about whether it's the nominative or the accusative. Why? Because there is no nominative. And it's expected that there is no nominative because actually these markers <coughs> only appear on non-subjects. You can uh, see your son or punish your son or talk about your son and do something else, but uh, this possessive marker well, similar to Russian story, is not very typical of the subject position. Okay, Russian is different because in some contexts you can use story uh, and subject, but here never. So the nominative is understandable. You don't expect it here. You understand it's not morphology; it's syntax. 
uh, uh, and uh, well, it's very economic. If we don't have a form of the nominative, which would be just the stem and the possessive prefix mark because we don't need it, well, probably we can exploit this same form uh, for something else, for example, for the accusative, which is the next uh, most frequent case. Okay, so very elegant. What about the genitive? There are no possessive genitives in this language. So when they use something like that, when they need to express something like that, what they use are morpholo uh, morphologically just possessive third-person markers or first-person markers or second-person markers. For example, here, Baeta is glad to receive her husband's letter. So rejoice at the verb which takes a dative object. So she is glad to uh, rejoices about the letter. The letter is in the dative case, and the letter is her husband's. So theoretically, that's exactly the context where we could expect, where we could expect something like a possessive reflexive, because the uh, husband is by a past husband. But in fact, it's completely different. It, well, completely, it's somehow different. So what we got here is nie and it's um, it's uh, third person mark. So um, mm, uh, traditional grammars are a little silent on this, uh, but I think that the explanation is actually a syntactic one. Uh, we don't have time to go through all the details, but uh, I believe that the real explanation is that, in fact, the possessive reflexive is only used when the uh, nominal in question is a core argument of the subject. So there is one word which takes both the subject and something else, an accusative direct object or a dative uh, object or something else. So here is not the case. So within this noun phrase, um, uh, within this noun phrase, there is no subject. So we need a local subject, so to say. I think so. I have some evidence for this, but you, I understand this one example doesn't necessarily persuade you. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, and uh, an important thing is that the genitive is never used as a verbal dependent. So the only type of context that you can find with genitive is within noun phrases. So, uh, syntactically, they are very different from all other cases that there are. Maybe some people even don't think uh, the genitive is one of the cases. They think it's a different category because they are uh, in terms of syntactic domains. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about the noun phrase structure. So the uh, most important rule we have to remember and will be recurrent through the remainder of this uh, part of my book, of course, is that the most syntactic box of the noun phrase is its head and it's necessarily its rightmost end in the noun phrase. This is very important because it's kind of a principle that prevails and it's more important than distinction between uh, parts of speech or uh, even layers within the noun phrase. But what you have to remember is whatever is the rightmost part of the noun phrase is functionally its head and its <coughs> the most syntactic corpus. So, for example, the case markers that pertain to the noun phrase are always on its rightmost element, regardless of the internal structure. Okay? Sometimes it's very transparent, sometimes it's less transparent. Here is the linear order of the noun phrase. Well, it's kind of expected in many respects, for example, and uh, here on the left periphery we've got possesses and uh, relative clauses and demonstratives. So these elements are uh, responsible for, let's say, referentiality and location, uh, lo lo locating the referent in the space of discourse. Yeah, so you identify the reference through things like that. It's uh, 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 my mother, for example, or Peter's house, or the house, uh, the girl I talked to you about, or this girl. All of these things uh, make it possible for the speaker, for the hearer, to identify what the bag, or the house, or the girl uh, we are speaking about. Yeah? What is the girl we are speaking about? Okay, here uh, they are on the left periphery, and then come things which are uh, modifying the meaning of the noun phrase. So adjectives, numerals, and um, those committative things, and mm, uh, nouns in a positive uh, relations, uh, such as. Um, uh, uh, so was a week, yeah, something like that. Okay, uh, so, uh, and finally the head down as expected. Uh, what I want, wanted you 
Now, to, uh, there are two things which I wanted to discuss in more detail. So first is that the adjectives and nouns are not uh, differentiated uh, in terms of their position in the lexicon. So many, many items can find function as either. And traditional grammars distinguish between the two based on which is marked for case. Yeah, so uh, adjectives are not marked for the case as all pre-noun, pre-head elements within the noun phrase and nouns are marked for case as all heads in the noun phrase. But lexically, these can be uh, the same items and most of the time you can invent, although of course uh, for words with meaning such as big, for example, it is more natural to be used as modifiers and for um, uh, uh, words which mean something like, you know, a uh, woman, it's more typical to be used as the head noun. But uh, under some circumstances, you can um, uh, use a different uh, Just one example, and this is by in, which can also be either rich as an adjective or a rich man as a noun. The main difference is where it's in the linear position or structural position within the noun phrase. So for example, he walked and walked and made, uh, met a rich old man by in good. So this one is a modifier and this one uh, function as the head. So the case marker is here and it's not present here. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that it's theoretically possible to um, flip them around. Yeah? So to, to, to uh, use this one, the, uh, I, the word which expresses the idea of uh, age and sex as a modifier and the word which is um, expressing the idea of richness as the uh, head noun. At least the uh, same uh, word here uh, is used as the head noun and it's used with the acoustic market. And uh, again, you see, for example, they like, like stories like that. It's very typical. On the, uh, uh, a large part uh, of their folklore about, I know, clever people who are making some tricks uh, uh, about uh, rich people. Uh, it's a very typical uh, thing. So the clever man managed to, uh, to um, uh, see the rich man and also to abduct his daughter. Uh, so this is this one is the rich man. So he is a miser and uh, a, a rich man. So again, I don't know how to say this. It, it, it even contains a suffix. It's a, a nominalizer. So an agent nominal or something. But nevertheless, here it's used, if you want, you can say that it's used as a modifier. An alternative way to say it is to say that these are two nouns, but uh, just for purposes of economy, uh, the only noun that uh, actually bears a case suffix is the second one. I don't know. Uh, theoretically, you can say uh, th this is simultaneously um, uh, an adjective. Well, theoretically, an adjective which can only be used uh, in reference to a person which is characterized as a miser in those rare cases where uh, this same person is additionally characterized by another property which is, happens to be expressed as an outfit, as, as the head of the an outfit. Okay, very complicated. So quite a possibility, but I don't know how to um, um, uh, accommodate this uh, uh, differently. So uh, a short way to say the, to express this idea will be just uh, to say that uh, the distinction between nouns and adjectives is not very deeply relevant for the grammar uh, of Kalmyk, and that's the option I prefer, basically. So, um, um, the same is true of the numerals, we don't have to uh, care about those. And finally, um, I want you to go back to this structure. Maybe you uh, uh, noticed, maybe you haven't, uh, you didn't, uh, that there is possessive intergenitive which is in the leftmost position in the noun phrase. The pattern which is also shared by Turkic and most two music languages. Okay, but here we also have uh, non-referential genitives. So morphologically the same form but different function. So here that's the actual possessor, my father's house uh, or Bagma's um, bag or car or something like that. And here um, we've got um, things which um, modify uh, nouns without reference to individual um, uh, entities in the real world. 
some reason I, I, I just realized today that I've got good art examples of it, but believe me, uh, <laughs> it's the same in Kowling. Uh, so, uh, Badma's beautiful book. Badma is the real possessor, so that's the beautiful book uh, here. And uh, Badma is found to the left uh, of the adjective, so in the left periphery of the noun frame is functions as an anchor in Mashka Chesterton's uh, terms. But here, Jagama wrote a beautiful children's book. So here we've got children, but these are not referential. So these are not three particular kids we can uh, we have in mind. What is implied is that this book is the book for children, something like that. So although this is expressed as the genitive, um, but it's kind of a different genitive, functional thing. So and it's found linearly much closer to the head noun. So for example, it's uh, after the uh, after the adjective. So very nicely, uh, the linear position of modifiers uh, reflects their uh, function rather than their morphological form. Yeah? So the very fact that genitives uh, can be used in both senses is not unique to a Mongolic. Uh, for example, in Juridic we've got exactly the same, but as far as I know, I might be wrong with some detail. Okay, I can tell about Bashkir, which I worked on. Bashkir definitely has the genitive for both functions. Uh, but in regardless of the function, is in the left most position within the noun phrase. Okay, so the form is, so to say, more important than the function. And I think that something like that is also attested in other Turkic languages, maybe not in all of them in Nohakas. I think the same thing. The same, yeah. So I, I, it's something like, well, I sort of expect this, but in Kalmyk it doesn't work. So Kalmyk is very iconic, so to say. It's not unique in this respect. I, um, I have a uh, well, sometimes uh, things like that happens, uh, like I don't know, a new woman's journal. But in, in, as far as I understand, um, um, in, in, in English, uh, it's uh, sort of <coughs> lexicalized, isn't it? I, I'm not sure. <coughs> okay. mm. uh, I don't think you can use it all the time. Yeah. So uh, contrasts like, uh, like like this exist, uh, but they're sort of marginal. In Latin, for example, the contrast is exactly. In, Exactly the same. So again, the little, girl, uh, the little girl's new chair would be uh, well. In this case, you've got the possessor on the left periphery, the new, which is the characteristic of the chair, is closer to the chair. Whereas if it's uh, something like a new chair, which be chair which belongs to those that type of chairs which is used for little girls, then it will be um, the new will be here and uh, modified to the. the Genitive modifier to the head of the after the uh, adjectival modifier to the head of the noun phrase. Okay, so contracts like that exist. It's a topic I'm very much interested in. So I will be interested to see to get some feedback from you if you know other languages which behave this way. Yeah, so quite consistently. But how, what, what I can say for sure is that uh, Kalmyk makes this mm, uh, semantic uh, distinction. Uh, between the two types of genitives, depending on what their um, mm, functions. Okay, so just uh, one uh, word about uh, coordination. So uh, the pattern we see now on this slide is probably not the only one, and uh, actually they have some like end nowadays uh, and use it unfortunately. But the more elegant way of um, uh, expressing coordination in uh, Kalmyk is the pattern which involves numerals, which is also shared by other Mongolian languages, and as far as I understand, is not found in uh, Turkic and in Turkic, and maybe in Lewis, it's used as well. So, what's here? It's uh, a story about um, a very crazy thing happening, so some magician being involved and uh, Putting the soul of one person into another, and then uh, it goes out through the cow and its calf. So you don't have to think about sense of it because it's not easy to understand. But what we shall should care about is the syntactic structure. So I just needed an example with some case marking. And so where is the case marking? The case marking is on the noun, which literally means two. So literally is this cow, this calf, no case markings. Markers, this cow, no case markers, two of them, case marker finally, it went out. Okay? 
So literally, um, if I give a book to Peter and Paul, it would be Peter and Paul, two, two of them, and give the book. Something, some, something like that. So the nouns them, themselves are not marked for case in these countries, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the conjunction, conjunction, conjunction like element, which is simultaneously a numeral, uh, is here. Uh, there are some occasional examples with three as well. So if you have three entities, it's also possible. I'm not sure if uh, higher numerals are possible, and it's not very e easy to come across context. So I don't know if it's a, a syntactic or a lexical pattern, but nevertheless, at least with two, it's quite strong uh, and it's the default pattern. But again, it fits the general picture. The general picture is whatever is in the end of the noun phrase, even if it's something <coughs> conjunction, is marked for case and position. Okay? Yeah, position would be here as well. If it were my brother and sister, then it would be brother, and sister, two of those my people, somewhere. Okay, you, nothing yet. Two of those my. All right. Uh, do we have any time left? Probably. Okay, one minute. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe not. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I will start with uh, uh, pronouns uh, tomorrow, and we can have one minute of questions. I know if you uh, if you want to ask something about something I told you about today. Elmo asked of Jed, maybe a missing Jed. When it is used, ah, is only used with announced uh, uh, with uh, this extension. Okay, okay. so here, yeah. So in fact, slightly more complicated because. Not all um, nouns with uh, extension are exactly like this, but they are not possible with uh, nouns without extension. Mm -hmm. And the pronouns are possible. And uh, how does uh, the uh, go affix interact with the case extension? Uh -huh. uh, no, no, uh, no extension there. Mm -hmm. uh, Forceless, forceless man, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, why horse in genitive uh, has a back vowel? Mm -hmm. uh, no, 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 it's just, sorry, it's murder now. It's murder now. Uh, I can see it, you probably can't. But uh, uh, they are there, I'm sorry, because of this red line here. Um, are there, this is cheating because you didn't talk about derivation, but are there derivation of suffixes that derive, say, nouns from other words? Yeah, from nouns, anything? From, 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 from whether from verbs or from nouns? Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, so from uh, 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 with verbs, it's uh, omnipresent. So there are several of them, and one is very productive and it's used very often. It's maybe even viewed as one strategy of complementation, not necessarily so, I can know, similar to Polish more or less, I'd say, something like that, so regular and um, the, the main pattern is of course participial, let's say, so uh, things which can also be used as kinds of relative clauses or even in finite context, but there are clearly nouns which can be used as heads of complement. So with, with verbs, uh, yes, with adjectives, uh, well, uh, kind of, yes, but I think these are not, uh, I, I don't remember any subjects which is, like, you know, very, very So, Sounds uh, like you wouldn't need it. But I was just curious whether the right nouns were as ambiguous between noun and adjective as uh -huh. you know, basic nouns. That's a good question. So, I don't, I'm not sure about these verbal okay. nominalization, if they can be used as modifiers. Mm. So whatever I remember will be like, uh, yeah. Some, for example, this Surabul which I mentioned is actually a, a derived noun, and it can be used as a, a modifier. But it's not productive. I can't even identify the suffix. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's uh, uh, is to ask and to 
uh, to study and things like that. But um, I don't, I can't even say what's the suffix there and whether it's regular and it's not definitely not used with like hundreds of uh, other verbs. So uh, it's more marginal, it's less regular. That uh, in fact, uh, these uh, we've mentioned several things which are function um, in this way. So the agent nominal, uh, nominalizer is ch, and the two which sort of derive adjectives with ta and wo, but uh, in fact they can also refer to not to uh, entities to reference. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, yeah, I think we have to stop now. Thank you.